Dorothy, can you hear me? Yeah, it took me a while to get unmuted. Okay. <laughs> has, the media, has the discussion already oh, begun, Pastor? Second, no. No, okay, Dorothy, I wanted to ask a question that I think you might be a good resource. Okay. Um, I have a refrigerator that is used, but in extremely good shape that I have given to a lady friend of mine who now has her grandchild living with her and she needs more food space. But I didn't know, did the church have a crew of men, young men with a truck that could pick it up here at my house and take it three miles to Yvonne's house? <laughs> no, <laughs> in, in a word, I can't, I can't think of anybody that, um, some that we churches, have that is available for that. Some churches have kind of a crew of guys that go around and do. Yeah, I know. Let's see, so. Unfortunately, okay. well, I'll our move guys on. are all too old. <laughs> well, I'll move on to the next church. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Of course, she can't have the refrigerator till they finish my kitchen. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Dorothy. No problem. Is it trying to remove a refrigerator? Pardon? So I missed the conversation. Were you trying to move a refrigerator? Yes, I have given one to a lady friend who has her grandson living with her now, and she needs more refrigeration space. And soon I will not need this refrigerator. And so she asked if she could have it. And I said, well, we'll just have to find a way to get it to your house. She doesn't live very far from here. She lives right near Carmen in Las Posas. So it's not a big job. We're willing to, you know, um, either make a donation to the church or a six pack of beer and some money to the guys, whatever <laughs> is their currency. <laughs> So, yeah, I'm trying to figure out hmm, how big of a refrigerator is it? It's a standard kitchen size, side by side. Side by side, the double door. Right, double doors. Oh, well, you know, I have a couple of weeks. I'll just keep calling. Yeah, <laughs> put a call out. <laughs> yes, a call out. And maybe I should put something in the acorn. <laughs> Wanted. Who would be able to move a refrigerator? And whereabouts do you live, Beth? I'm sorry, where do I live? Yeah, whereabouts do you uh, live? I'm just uh, 50 feet from the Dorothy, or from the Bush, Nancy Bush Park. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Las Posas and Crestview. Yeah, and, yeah, by yeah. the uh, Catholic Church. Right, by the... The, no, that's not the new one anymore. That's the middle-aged one. <laughs> the Padre Sarah is newer. Right. But that used to be the new Catholic church because, of course, the one over there that was the Camarillo family church oh. on Ventura Boulevard. Okay. The birthday oh. cake, we called it. The birthday cake. Because of the way the top is shaped. It's like a cake. Tear oh. and tear and tear and tear. <laughs> They have beautiful stained glass windows in them with a great story. Right. Well, um, yeah, not too far. It's just like maybe three miles. Is it three miles? Oh, yeah, just straight down Las Posas, right? Right off. It doesn't of matter course. getting it onto a truck and the then truck and off. off. So they probably need one of those dollies that you can lean yeah. it back. Yeah. And, you know, I've seen I, I've seen some folks. Um, who was that? I, yeah, actually, maybe it was one of those YouTube videos of them um moving a refrigerator like that and a single person did it oh and it was just scary but the way they do it is actually pretty amazing how they do it i don't think they were 81 no <laughs> <laughs> that, i i don't mean this to be griping all the time but i tell you turning 81 has been not just a benchmark time because you're into the eighth decade, but it has had so many things happen or come into my world that I never thought would be part of my life at all. Never. Really? Yeah. Really? <laughs> all of them joyful, but you know, they're still there. <laughs> there are challenges. Every age has its yes. challenges. Um, and I guess it's one of those where uh, with each 
year or decade or season, uh, it's a matter of adjusting, isn't it? Yes, and trying to find that it makes some sense because I have no benchmarks to go to in the sense of my, uh, <laughs> my grandparents lived longer, but I didn't know them real well and they were not very good capacity in later years. My parents lived to their mid 70s, so I've outlived them. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know, it's just uh, a challenge. And I'll tell you, Job made me think about that. <laughs> really? Maybe I don't want that God. <laughs> well, <laughs> well the, 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 like we were talking last night, that story of the, the, the frame story, it, yeah. it's, it, it's I don't like the frame story. You, you got to read Job without it. Yeah, it's the, it's it is deceiving. deceiving because, I mean, that's not the type of God that we believe in, one that would play, you know, uh, a bet on someone's yes. life. Right? Yes. That, that's not it. Um, again, we have to read that in the context of when, it, you know, back in, you know, it probably was written around um, around second or third century BC. You know, they kind of had this image of a God that kind of had that, you know, uh, you know, because even if you think about Greek mythology, what do the gods do in Greek mythology except just party all the time and just kind of play tricks on the people, right? <laughs> so they kind of had that image of um, uh, a god that just kind of was up there. And so that's, that's where the kind of that frame story just kind of came about and it was stuck onto the story of Job. But then Job is actually more than that. And, and, and the real uh, value of the book of Job is that um, the poetry section from chapter three, section, to yeah. chapter 41, you got to take out the frame story to, especially in our modern times, to really yeah. see the, the, the thought provoking process of that. And I think that the, the frame part is very much in line with what um, Ecclesiastes and the one that preceded that. Uh, Proverbs. Proverbs was about a simple teaching tool yeah, that yeah. could be done in short, quick statements. Right. And it's what people wanted to aspire to, which is if I'm good and don't sin, I'll have rewards. Simple. Yes. Right. right. And if I'm good, I get my rewards. Now I can tell my son, please read the second part again. <laughs> <laughs> right. But yeah. Um, unfortunately, life that we know, experience, is a lot more, it's not that simple. It's a lot more challenging than that. I, I wish it were at times. <laughs> that is true. You either choose this or that. Right. Well, welcome, everyone. Um, I realized that I did not send out a, a reminder email at whenever during the day is, um, kind of got busy with other things. And so not, now I'm realizing, again, Dorothy and I had this conversation. If, I, if, if that reminder email does not go out, do people remember that there's a class at three o'clock on, on Wednesdays? And well, some of us did. Yes, you are. And this is what I call the, 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 the you know, the, the faithful group, the, the wise and faithful group. Uh, that know that every Wednesday we do have a class going and and we're kind of coming to the end of this series so today we are going to be looking at the uh, the character of Esther and next week we'll be looking at the the three Marys in Jesus's time Mary Magdalene uh, Mary of Bethany and uh, uh, Mary the mother of Jesus um, but um, and then after that uh, Dr. Bill will be um, teaching a four-week class, three-week, three-week, I think three-week class on sacred cities of the various religions, uh, various faith traditions. So th that would be interesting. That that would be, um, again, very different. This is like a, a Bible study uh, type of uh, Zoom class. And when Dr. Bill does his three weeks, it will be on, it will be like a, a tour. Uh, going through the journeys uh, or, you know, traveling to various uh, religious holy sites. And so I think that would be uh, interesting. Maybe one of these days, um, uh, I don't know how many of you have uh, been to the Holy Land, um, but 
uh, I have many pictures, a lot of pictures from the Holy Land that when I went there um, a few years ago, actually right before the pandemic. And so um, I, I can definitely do a series on uh, walking the steps of Jesus and showing different um, pictures of the Holy Land. Uh, so anyhow, those are some ideas that we have down the pipeline and they see some folks uh, continue to come on. So hello, everyone. And again, I apologize that I forgot to uh, put out the, the reminder um, that we do have a class at, uh, at three o'clock on Wednesdays um, to continue in our uh, study in the women of the Bible uh, uh, class. And oh, I realized I titled my outline wrong, but <laughs> it's okay. Um, so let's see, uh, da, 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 da. I will share my screen. Let's see. Can y'all see that? Yes. Okay. So today we are continuing in our, um, uh, our lesson on the uh, looking at various women uh, of the Bible. And today we come to a very famous character. In fact, um, if, 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 if whenever I you know, would just do a, a popcorn question of name of uh, uh, a woman of the Bible, you know, this character on uh, Esther uh, is one that uh, always comes up. In fact, where am I? There it is, Esther. We're on session five, and we're looking at the character of Esther. So Esther is one that everyone knows of. Um, we have uh, a women's group, uh, our um, UMW or United Women in Faith. Is it United Women in Faith or of Faith? United Women. Hi, Helen. What is it? The in Faith or of Faith? In Faith. In Faith. Okay, United Women in Faith. <laughs> Um, group that uh, we have the Esther's group. So Esther is one that is very well known, but um, a lot of times, um, you know, uh, we when you actually read the story of Esther, there's there's a lot more than just being a, um, a, a popular name that everyone knows. So we're going to be looking at Esther today. All right. So with that, let's see, let me get my notes together. And all right. So uh, before we begin, let's join together with a word of prayer and maybe other people will hop on. Well, oh, gracious, loving God, we are truly grateful to you for this afternoon. And again, um, for the series, as we continue to look through the different uh, 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 female characters, uh, women in the Bible that have shaped our uh, Judeo-Christian uh, heritage. Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit uh, be upon us and that your spirit will lead us and, and, and guide us as, as we look upon uh, this character, the story of Esther, and how um, the, the story shapes and uh, frames um, our faith. Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit, as always, be our guide and our teacher. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So, who is Esther? So, what do you guys know about the, the story of Esther? So, Esther um, is basically, in a nutshell, it was an orphan girl who um, became a queen in, uh, during the time of, uh, in, the, in the land of Persia. And then she saves the, the Jew Jewish people from extermination. In a nutshell, that's who Esther is. And that's the story of Esther. Now, it's um, just like the character that we looked at last week, uh, Ruth. Um, Ruth and Esther are the only two uh, by, uh, books in the Bible that are named after women. You know, so so a lot of times uh, people we looked at just the, the the character of Ruth last week, and today we look at um, Esther. Esther uh, um, has what twelve cha ten chapters, so it's a much longer book, but it reads like a novel. It reads like a drama. In fact, um, I, there's been many movies made out made from Esther because it is a dramatic read. Um, 10 chapters, but it reads really fast because of all the action sequences that's in there. And maybe I'm saying that because I'm a boy. Um, I like to read action <laughs> stories, but it's very, um, there's a lot of things that go, goes on um, in the story of Esther. 
Esther is also a very interesting book. The fact that, okay, well, first of all, um, as I mentioned last time, just like the book of Ruth, uh, Esther is in that third portion of the, um, of the Old Testament, or what we call the Hebrew Bible, or what we call the Old Testament, uh, what is the Hebrew Bible. And um, the Hebrew Bible is written, uh, broken into three parts. The first part is the, uh, the Torah, which is the, the, right, um, the laws, you know, um, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, uh, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And then you have the, the, the book of the, uh, what we call the prophets, which is all the historical and the prophetic um, books in the Old Testament. And then all the other poetry and literary work is what is part of this third part uh, called uh, the Ketuvim or, the, or it's, it's called the writings. And so the thing that differentiates the writings even um, from the, 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 what we call the, the prophets, the historical books is that the historical books are supposed to be um, uh, they're basically court accounts. They're accounts of historical accounts of Israelite history. Um, a lot of times uh, for the Jewish people, the Bible, the Hebrew Bible is their historical book. And so the, the, the prophetic books are tell about the history of Israel during those ancient times. The reason why it's interesting is because like we saw last week, the story of Ruth, you would think that it's in the historical section and in the Old Testament, we have it in the historical section, but, the, um, but in the Hebrew Bible, it's not part of the historical section, it's a story. So even though Ruth is part of the genealogy of Jesus or even the genealogy of King David, they don't, they, the, the story of Ruth could almost be um, a, a fictional book that just kind of tells about perhaps that, that might be the storyline. So it's not always necessarily historical. Esther is the same thing. Esther is in the, the third section of Ketuvim, which is the writing, which is a part of the, 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 the prophetic book, or the, the, um, the poetry books, the, the Proverbs, the Psalms, the Ecclesiastes, Job. Job, we know, uh, we just said, uh, come, um, Dr. Bill finished that uh, um, teaching about Job on Tuesday night. And from that class, you know, again, we know that Job was not a real character. It's not a historical character. It's a story that tells us of some, you know, that, that challenges us with some um, 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 theological concepts that, that for us to grapple with. So Job is, again, it's, it's, it's not a historical book. Esther is just like that. We don't know if it's fact or fiction. <laughs> Interesting thing is, is, is that um, uh, Esther, the, the book of Esther is read every year, just like Ruth was read during the, um, is among the, one of the five festivals in the Jewish calendar year, uh, the book of Ruth is read during the, the Feast of Tabernacles, uh, or not, not she, is, is read during Pentecost, during the, uh, for the, um, uh, the Jewish tradition around, uh, well, Pentecost. We, we're actually going to be celebrating Pentecost this coming Sunday in our Christian calendar. The Jewish calendar is, is similar. 50 days after Passover, they celebrate what is known as um, the Feast of Weeks, which is a harvest time. And so they read the book of Ruth during that harvest time, which is around this time of year. The book of Esther is read every year around February or March during a festival called Purim. And I will talk about that um, in a bit. And so again, it's read almost like a historical book, but, um, but the tradition in, even in Judaism uh, knows that it, it, it could be a fictional book. It could be a fictional story um, that has some historical ties to it, but not necessarily needs to be a factual book. So anyhow, um, the book of Esther was the last book to be canonized into the Old Testament. The Old Testament, um, again, much of the writings that in the Old Testament were written after the, the, the exile, um, the Babylonian exile, which was in 586 BC, so sixth century BC, much of the Old Testament was put together after that, so around 5th century BC, or even 4th or 3rd century BC is when the old, a lot of the Old Testament writings were put together. Now, some of the writings, like the, 
like some of the earlier historical books like uh, first and second Samuel, first and second Kings may have been court records um, during those times that were then compiled after the exile. However, um, again, much of the, the Old Testament was written and, and taught after the exile. Esther, on the other hand, was the last book to be compiled as part of the Holy Scriptures uh, for the Jewish people. And it wasn't canonized until 90 AD. It's the last book in the Old Testament. Um, so 90 AD, you're talking around the same time when the Gospel of John was written, or you know, just shortly before the, the book of Revelation was written. That's 90 AD. So the book of Esther was canonized. And now that, that, that doesn't mean that it was written around that time, but it is the last book to be canonized, mean, being part of the sacred scripture for the Hebrew Bible. And the reason why it's the last book to be canonized is because the controversy be, um, 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 of whether to include it uh, with the Hebrew Bible or not had to do with the fact that the book of Esther does not mention God at all. It has no reference to God. It has zero reference to the Jewish faith, or it, it, it doesn't even have anything to do with the Mosaic laws. Um, so the question was, well, then why is this? It could almost be a secular story that was put into the Hebrew Bible. And the reason for that was it gave reason to create the celebration um, of, of what is known as Purim. It is a festival of Purim. So anyhow, um, it is read twice a year, uh, or it's read everywhere twice, okay? During this festival of Purim, which is around February or March, um, it's, uh, when we read the story in the book of Esther, we will see that on the 13th day of the 12th month, which is Adar, which when it says 12th month, we're not talking about December from January to December. Um, remember the, the Jewish calendar starts with Rosh Hashanah, which is around September-ish time, right? Give or take. It's, uh, the Jewish calendar is, is based on the lunar year and their lunar year usually starts somewhere in the fall uh, around September, October-ish time. And so from there, 12 months, well, it's not 12 months, it's, um, it, it comes around. Uh, it's around usually based upon the lunar calendar is around um, February or March. It was March this year. On the 13th day of the 12th month of uh, Adar, which is Adar, they celebrate this, this festival of Purim. And what this festival celebrates is it commemorates the, uh, the survival of the Jewish people from a genocide. Now, it's interesting that as you know, in the 21st century, we read this and we think about the genocide of the Jewish people. And for us, we would normally think of, well, during the Holocaust, right? The, you know, in the 20th century under Adolf Hitler. But throughout history, the, the Jewish um, community or the Jewish people have faced many, many, many challenges throughout, throughout their history. And that is true for all, all um, um, faiths and all um, uh, uh, groups of people. You know, history itself, when you really look at history of all groups of people, history is not kind. <laughs> history is very violent and history tends to be very, um, just full of, of uh, um, just horrific events. And so even back in the, Again, in the first century, when the book of Esther was canonized into the, the, um, the Hebrew Bible, the reason why it was canonized was because it celebrates the people of Israel, the Jewish people, surviving a very horrific time called, um, that was uh, a genocide that was called upon um, the people of, uh, of Israel, Jewish people, um, by this person named Haman, which is a, uh, one of the characters in the in the uh, book of Esther. So that is the reason why this book was canonized and is part of the Hebrew Bible, even though it has nothing to do with faith or not the faith that we think of. 
um, it, it has nothing to do with, it, it doesn't mention God at all. Uh, and it doesn't really refer to any mosaic tradition. However, the story itself kind of does challenge what it means to have faith. So let's put it that way. Um, like I said, it has that paradoxical origin. Uh, it's not, it's, it's actually, when you read it, you realize, oh, this is more like a novel. It is a, a fictional story. And yet this fictional story kind of gives uh, meaning or purpose to a, a festival, a tradition, uh, a historical tradition that is celebrated every year. Um, and again, like I said, it's read twice because during this festival of Purim, they read it once through all 10 chapters in the beginning, and then they have this celebration, and then they read it again a second time at the end. So you can imagine this book of Esther becomes very well known in the uh, you know, children and, and in, the, in the lives of the Jewish people. Um, they know this story very well because they read it straight through twice every year. Okay, so let's look at the story, the setting. Um, <clears throat> kind of giving you a background history again of, of, for the context of, of the story of Esther. Um, 1000 BC is when Israel was at its height. Uh, 1000 BC is, over, is, is when we kind of uh, place during the time of King David. So King David um, uh, reigned around 1000 BC. And during the King, da um, King David's time, he's the one that kind of united all the tribes of Israel and made it into one nation, um, the kingdom of Israel. Um, and then, of course, after King David, uh, his son, King Solomon, took over. And then through King Solomon's uh, diplomacy, he negotiated and, and the kingdom of Israel was at its super height. And so that little map over there has the United Kingdom of Israel. It was, it's much larger than the, the, the country or the nation of Israel today, right? It's a lot bigger. It, it spanned um, all the way up and down the, that, um, the Palestinian region, um, and it crossed over to the Jordan River and included all of the, uh, a, a, a huge chunk um, uh, east of the Jordan River, um, which now everything east of the Jordan River is, uh, today is the, the nation of Jordan. It's not Israel, right? But back in the Davidic and, and King Solomon days, those were all part of the kingdom of Israel. And then, of course, after, um, uh, uh, after King Solomon uh, died, uh, the uh, Solomon's son, um, Solomon's son, Rehoboam, and uh, his general, Jeroboam, uh, got into a fight and they split the nation into two. And so then we have the divided kingdom. The upper portion is called the kingdom of Israel. The bottom portion is called the kingdom of Judah. And then in 722, the um, uh, a neighboring nation called Assyria um, came in and conquered the northern kingdom. So that, that northern part, the kingdom of Israel, was where uh, was conquered by this uh, this other country called Assyria. And the way the Assyrians conquered wasn't like they came in with um, you know armies and tanks and things like that. Um, they didn't conquer it through military might necessarily. The way they conquered the, that the northern part of Israel uh, was because all throughout this time, the, the, the people of Israel struggled with trying to understand their faith and their understanding of, of God and, and what it means to worship. And so during that, in 722, what the kingdom of Assyria did was they flooded that northern kingdom with their own people. And when I said they flooded, they basically, you had this mass... Um, uh, uh, infiltration of people um, outside of Israel that then came in and then they basically it didn't happen in one year it happened over time um, but the the people in the northern kingdom started to intermarry with people from Assyria and these foreigners and the identity of uh, the Israelites kind of dissipated and by 722 and that's just kind of the date when that whole northern kingdom just didn't was then became um, uh, was no longer the the, the 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 king of Israel. Pretty much was um, was what, what do you call kicked out, ruled out, and so much of when we read the stories of um, in the New Testament, 
uh, a lot of times we, we know about the story uh, uh, the people of the Samaritans, but that the Samaritans are from that region of the Northern Kingdom. And the reason why the Samaritans were, um, were looked down upon by the Jewish people, because the Jewish people, what it means to be Jewish is taken from the word Judah. The people of Judah became the Jewish people and they looked down upon the Samaritans because the Samaritans were people of that Northern Kingdom that intermarried and uh, assimilated with other cultures. And that's when that whole idea of, of the of, of people, the Jewish people sticking only to themselves and not uh, integrating and getting along with other nations started to propagate. So anyhow, uh, 722, that Northern Kingdom kind of gets washed out. And then 586 is the big date in um, uh, um, Jewish history. That's when the Babylonians, uh, a nation to the east, comes over and they come with military might and just completely demolish um, that southern kingdom. Uh, they've already conquered the northern kingdom. Uh, the, the, the Syrians were overtaken by the Babylonians and then the Babylonians come in and just destroy the, the southern kingdom. And then after the conquest, um, a third of the people in, uh, in Judah are executed. A third of them are taken into captivity um, into Babylon. And that, that's a, a bigger map. Um, on the left side, you see that blue body of water. So Israel is along there. You can sort of see where Jerusalem is. And then that, that red line, that pathway, the, the people of, um, that were exiled were taken all the way to uh, Babylonia, which is on that right side. Um, a third of the, uh, the people, and those people were, were the, the skilled laborers, um, the, the ones who were, I would say, like the middle class who were educated and had skills to help the Babylonian society, but were not going to cause trouble by trying to overtake Babylon. Um, because all the, part, all the, the aristocrats, the, the politicians, and all of those were executed when Babylon came in and, and conquered Israel. Um, the, the, the middle class uh, were taken into captivity and then the, the lower third, the ones who were the outcasts and the ones, um, uh, they were just left uh, in Jerusalem, in Israel to, to just suffer and die. Again, it was a war-torn land, so there was no way for them to survive. And so then um, those who were then taken into uh, exile they are they live in exile they're living in a foreign land but they weren't slaves a lot of times we think when they're taken into exile in this foreign land they became slaves to babylon and that's not true the israelites who were taken into babylon they now they were forced to adopt babylonian lifestyle they were given babylonian names they were given babylonian you know well they had jobs they were given jobs and they were given homes so they had homes they had jobs and then they were given Babylonian names, the primary thing that they wanted to do was uh, kind of remove their Israelite or Jewish identity and make them into, just a, a, have them assimilate into the Babylonian culture. In 539, so from 586 to 539, it's so about 50 some years, the Babylonian empire also collapses and a new empire uh, rises up and that's the Persian empire. You know, it's like that wonderful song um, that in, 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 what is that, Hamilton, the musical Hamilton, <laughs> that, the, um, uh, that, the, that the king sing, King George sings, you know, empires rise, empires fall, right? That's one of the lines of that song. Well, empires rise and empires fall. It, during around 1000 BC, the kingdom of Israel was the, the superpower of the world. In um, the 700 or, or 9th, 8th, and 8th century BC, Assyria was the superpower of the world. In 6th century BC, uh, Babylon was the superpower of the world. In, um, in 539, the Persian Empire um, takes over. After the Persian Empire, we have the Greek Empire. After the Greek Empire, we have the Roman Empire. N nations rise, nations fall. <laughs> That's just history. So in 539, and I'm giving you a lot of historical data, and you're like, where, 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 when are we getting to Esther? Well, 
It's during the Persian Empire period that the story of Esther comes about. So the, um, during the Persian Empire, um, one of the first kings, so we have King Cyrus was the first king who conquered Babylon. And then um, after that, soon after uh, King um, Cyrus, you have King Ahasuerus. And uh, King Ahasuerus, uh, for short, we call him King Xerxes. Xerxes is the Greek name. Ahasuerus is the Persian name. Um, it's so hard to say Ahasuerus, so call him King Xerxes. So King Xerxes comes to power. Now he is extravagant um, um, Persian Empire, and uh, he throws outlandish parties. So the book of Esther starts with these words. So this is the first words in Esther chapter one. This happened, so the story of Esther, this happened in the days of Ahasuerus, the same Ahasuerus who ruled over 127 provinces from India to Kush. So that was the Persian empire. In those days, when King Ahasuerus sat on his royal throne in the citadel of Susa, in the third year of his reign, he gave a banquet for all his officials and ministers. The army of Persia and Media, the nobles and the governors of the provinces were present while he displayed the great wealth of his kingdom and the splendor and pomp of his majesty for many days, 180 days in all. So he threw a party that lasted 180 days. Do you know how long 180 days equals to? <laughs> That's six months. <laughs> That's like half a year. So imagine having a festival or a party that lasts uh, six months. So it's in that, con so it's, it's kind of it starts this picture. And again, remember those words. Um, and we saw this last week when we looked at the book of Ruth. You know, there was in that story, um, the story of Ruth, that the words, it so happened, well, that those words are like the <coughs> storytelling type of <coughs> language. It so happened is one of those ways that this kind of tells you, okay, this is a fictional story that's just being told. Well, the book of Esther starts that way. This happened, this so happened in these days. Uh, so that's why uh, scholars read this and go, oh, okay, it, it is a fictional story that was told to kind of give reasonings or, or, or try to explain something in history. Anyhow, so King Hasuerus, he throws this outlandish party. And during this party, um, he, you know, so it's not just 180 days of party. Um, it's what happens in parties? Lots. Lots of eating and Ooh. lots of drinking. Drinking. And so it, 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 the story continues that in those days, you know, after the, 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 um, this banquet lasted many days or 180 days, and then he threw a second party. That, uh, and during these last seven days, the court garden, the king palace, he got his uh, officials together and then he invited king, uh, uh, his queen, who was Queen Vashti, to come over to display her beauty. And what it means by that was he wanted her to display her beauty in front of all his guests. Now you can understand what that kind of meant, right? It, 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 it has that very sexual connotation where Vashti, his queen said, I'm not doing that. And so she rejected, she said, no, I'm not gonna go in front of all your guests to display her beauty, meaning, um, you know, he wanted her to come in uh, naked and display her beauty, just wearing her crown to his guests. And she, she refuses. And because she refused, the king ends up exiling her. She, he exiles um, his queen, Vashti. And then guess what happens? Shortly after he exiles her, he regrets getting rid of his queen. Um, now I'm sure like many, like, queens or kings he had other concubines and so forth but his main you know queen and apparently she was very beautiful 
um, he, uh, he got rid of her. And so then he, then he starts regretting that he got rid of her. And so he wants to replace her. He, do, he doesn't want to bring her back because, you know, he can't do that. Um, so the only way he can replace her is, to, and he wants not just any queen. So it's not just going to take someone from a royal line. What he wants is, the, is someone just, who is as beautiful as Vashti. So what does he do? He calls for a beauty contest. <laughs> he calls for a beauty contest and for all the women in that area to, um, to, apply, or, or, to apply, I guess. I don't know. Anyhow, so that's how Esther becomes queen. Now, Esther was, her, her, her Jewish name is Hadassah, and she was an orphan child. She was living with her cousin, an old, much older um, cousin by the name of Mordecai. Um, so she was a, you can think that she was maybe teenage at that time and she was being raised by Mordecai and she was very fair and the and, and, uh, story says she was very beautiful and Mordecai just kind of encouraged her to go ahead and, and, and um, be part of this um, uh, beauty contest. And of course she becomes chosen and she becomes queen, okay? And now she knows and Mordecai trained her to make sure that when you become queen, you have to follow all the rules and you have to follow um, and, and make sure that you always abide by the, the rules on the court or else don't be like what happened to Vashti and be exiled. So she knows that she goes in and she is a, you know, she um, fo you know, follows and, and becomes a very good queen. During that time, while uh, when Esther became, as Esther is, um, is selected to become queen, uh, um, as Esther become queen, Mordecai, Mordecai uh, also becomes uh, uh, just, again, it so, just so happened that Mordecai was hanging out in front of the courts, um, in front of the palace gates, when he overheard a um, when he overheard some uh, top advisor, some some people uh, um, near the, in the courts who were planning, who are, who had this conspiracy plan to overthrow the king. And so what he does is he tells one of the advisors, and the advisors tells the king, and then that plot to overthrow the king gets overturned. And because of that, then uh, Mordecai. It, um, is his name is recognized, and he then um, the advisors kind of sees Mordecai. As, oh, okay, here is someone who is very faithful. Is going to be very faithful to uh, to the king. All this time, though, um, Mordecai and, and this whole I, I, idea that Mordecai was Jewish was sort of kind of kept hidden. Mordecai, um, but during one of the another outing. Mordecai is out in front of the gates, and then um, one of the king's top advisors by the name of Haman comes out, and he realizes, he sees that while, when he comes out, all the people are supposed to bow down, and, Haman, uh, and Mordecai refuses to bow down, because one, well, he refuses to bow down, and so Haman takes offense to that, and so then Haman goes around and asks, why doesn't that man bow in my presence? And then he, Haman finds out that it, he doesn't bow to anyone because he is Jewish. So, he, so Haman comes to understand, okay, what does it mean to be Jewish? Is that he is, um, uh, you know, he takes it as, oh, Mordecai is prideful and that he's not going to bow down to Haman, of course, Haman is very prideful and he wants everyone to bow down to him. And so what does Haman do? He doesn't like that. He decides to execute Mordecai. So he comes up with this, this lavish plan um, to uh, have um, Haman or, or to have Mordecai um, executed for being disrespectful to him. So what he does is he creates a, a huge gallop and Again, if you think about what the Romans used to do with those who oppose the, the, um, uh, the Roman Empire, the Romans would display those who um, uh, uh, oppose the empire 
by displaying them, either um, setting them on fire and putting them on pillars, or of course we know in our Christian tradition, uh, um, they crucified people, right? And, and the whole act of crucifix cruci um, crucifixion was an execution tool to display those who opposed the, the Roman Empire and by doing so to kind of cast this sense of fear among the people. So Haman had, to, had similar ideas, you know, centuries before, and he created this 50 uh, foot gallow to hang Mordecai, to make it a display to the people. This is what happens if you disrespect me, right? So then um, Mordecai, okay, so then he creates this, this plan to, to um, hang Mordecai. Just so happens after he built the gallows to hang Morde um, Mordecai, he comes into the courthouse and right at, when he comes back into the, um, to the court, the king had just awakened. Um, uh, and, 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 and it tells the story that the king the night before couldn't sleep and because he couldn't sleep, he started to read through the annals of the king. And so these annals are like, you know, document records and so forth. And in these annals of the king, it told about this man named Mordecai who uncovered a plot to kill the king. And therefore, because of that, his, um, the king's life was saved. It was recorded in there. And the king reads that and goes, oh my gosh, I never knew about that. And then, so then right when um, Haman comes into uh, uh, the courthouse to ask the king for permission to go and, and, and hang this man uh, by the name of Mordecai, as more, um, Haman comes into this court, courtroom, the king says to, um, uh, well, here's the story. Let me just read it for you. On that night, the king could not sleep. He gave orders to bring the, the book of record, the annals, and they were read to the king. It was found written how Mordecai had told about uh, Big Thana and, and Theresh, two of King's eunuchs who guarded the threshold and who had conspired to, king, uh, to kill the king, King Ahasuerus. With, then the king said, what honor or distinction had been bestowed on Mordecai for this? The king's servant who attended him said, well, nothing, nothing had been done for him. The king said, who is in the court? Now Haman had just entered the outer court of the king's palace to speak to the king about having Mordecai hung on a pole that he had prepared for him. So the king's servants told him, Haman is there standing in the court. And the king said, let him come in. So Haman came in and the king said to him, what shall be done for the man for whom the king wishes to honor? Okay, so this is the, the, the little twist of plot, okay? So the way the book of Esther kind of reads is it's, it's, it's somewhat comical in a way because the, as Haman comes in to ask permission to, to, to uh, execute, to, um, to hang Mordecai, more, king, the king, Ahasuerus, asks Haman, you know, there's this man that has done a good thing and I wish to honor him. What shall I do? And Haman's first thoughts are, that, must, that person must be me. And so Haman comes up with this lavish plan or la lavish idea of, well, this is what you should do to the, the man that, the person that you wish to honor. You should give this person a golden ring and, and, and give him fine clothes and, and, and have a parade to honor this man because that's what he wanted. And just then as um, uh, Haman tells the king, this is what should be done. The king tells to, to uh, says to Haman, Great, let's do everything that you have said, but let's do it for Mordecai, the very person that Haman wanted to have executed. So then, of course, uh, so that's the twist of fate. You know, Haman um, uh, wanted to, to execute Mordecai, but instead the king honors Mordecai instead. And, this, and, and as the story goes, you know, Haman is so frustrated that the person that he um, that he considered was his mortal enemy, this Mordecai, instead of being able to punish Mordecai for being disrespectful of, uh, to Haman, Mordecai is honored instead. And so Haman decides, you know what, I'm going to take revenge. Instead of just executing uh, uh, Mordecai, I'm going to execute 
everyone who he's related to. And so Haman then decides to, and since he is the highest official, think of him as like the chief of staff, right? Um, he calls upon, he, dis, he puts, sends out an edict that on the 13th day of the 12th month of Adar, uh, that the people that Mordecai is a part of, the Jewish people, would be executed. So he plans this mass exodus, um, not exodus, um, genocide, to be upon the Jewish people on that day. And Mordecai, of course, then real, uh, this real, have, you know, here it is. Haman decides, uh, determines to ex uh, execute or exterminate all the Jews on the 13th day of the 12th month called Adar. And then on that day, um, um, it was to be, this, this mass genocide was to happen. And so then Mordecai then hears about this and he goes to, Esther, to, who was the queen, and says, Esther, you're the queen. You need to do something about this. And Esther's response to Mordecai is, look, there are rules here. She can't, even though she's the queen, she can't just barge into the king and just say to the, the king, you know, don't do this. Or, or there's this uh, plot by Haman to, to kill all the, all the Jews. You can't do this. And so then um, uh, Esther says to, to Mordecai, you know, that it's not that easy. I can't do that. But Mordecai pleads to um, Esther once again. And this is what he says. Mordecai says to Esther, then when, when they told Mordecai what Esther had said, that she's, she, she can't just go in front of the king, Mordecai told them to reply to Esther. Do not think that in the in the king's palace, you can escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place, sure. But you and your family's family will perish. Who knows? Perhaps you have come to royal dignity for, for just such a time as this. Now, those are very famous words. Who knows? Perhaps you have come to royal dignity for just a time, for just such a time as this. Mordecai is basically telling Esther, you know, just because, you know, you, you are gifted with this beauty, just because you are able to win that beauty contest, and now that you are able to uh, become this queen and live this wonderful royal life in the court palace, don't take that for granted or don't, just don't think that that's just good fortune for you, perhaps there's a reason for that. And that's what Mordecai says to Esther. Who knows, perhaps you have come to royal dignity for just such a time as this. And then from that, Esther's response to him is, sure, fine, I'll do it. But Again, the reason why she hesitated to just go before the king is because according to that Persian um, law, law or rule, if anyone approaches the king without the king having first summoned um, that person, so even the, as the queen, she can't just go in, in front of the king. The king has to summon her. Um, the, the rule says that that person gets executed. And so Esther felt like she doesn't have the right, even as queen, to approach um, the king. But she says, after hearing this, she says, if I perish, I perish. And those are very famous words. Those, those words have um, um, been repeated in, in several places as a way of displaying Esther's courage and that willing to sacrifice herself, no matter what the consequence may be, she realized she had to do what, what, what was needed to save her people at that time. So anyhow, the, so the story of Esther continues and I can't click on this, oh, here it is. So then um, Esther goes, um, she can't approach the king. So what she does is she passes by back and forth um, in front of the king's palace until um, the king looks out his window and sees Esther out there. And as he sees out there, he reminds him, oh, you know, there's my beautiful Esther, my, my beautiful queen, and he invites her in. And she then kind of sets up, she doesn't just tell um, 
the king what Haman um, is planning to do in, in executing um, the Jewish people because Haman is there next to the king at all times as his uh, you know, top official or you know, chief of staff. Esther kind of devises this plan. She throws a lavish party because she knows that the king loves lavish parties. She throws this lavish party, she throws a banquet, and she invites the king and Haman to both come to her secret banquet. And at that banquet, after they've eaten, they're full, the king is in, um, 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 is in a happy place. Uh, Esther then pleads to uh, King Xerxes to save her people. And she tells um, the people um, the story that there is this plot to kill all her people and, uh, and, and kind of stirs the, the king's heart to, to, to do whatever he can to save um, her people. Up to this point, she doesn't reveal who her people is. And so the king is stirred. Haman is sitting right next to him and doesn't realize um, you know, uh, that she's talking about the Jewish people. And right at the end of that conversation, the king finally asks, so what people are you part of? And at that point, Esther says, the Jewish people, the very people that this man sitting next to you, Haman, is plotting to kill. That on the, on the 13th day of the 12th month of Adar, that the, all the Jews are set to be executed. Now, you think that the king can just reverse all that, that plan, but the way Haman had, had, had um, set out that, that, that edict, um, Haman actually had the king send out the edict to execute the, the, these people of the Jews. So what the, the king does instead, of course, is one, of course, um, had Haman be executed for, for having um, uh, planned that without the king's knowing, and then he sends out another edict that tells the people of the Jewish people that on that day, when the, when the, when the other people uh, um, opposes the Jewish people to, uh, to execute them, for them to rise up and defend themselves. And that became then the whole festival of the Purim, that on that day, the people of the Jewish people had the right to, to take up, unfortunately, to take up arms and to defend themselves against those who plotted to, um, to annihilate them. And that's what the, the, the festival of Purim is all about. The Jewish people are saved from the genocide and on that day, the day of annihilation then turns to, well, a day of compassion and peace. And so on that day, because the people of uh, the Jewish people were able to save themselves and not and, and reverse this, this genocide plot that the festival of Purim that the Jewish people um, um, celebrate now is that on that day, uh, instead of it being a day of killing, it be a day of compassion and peace for the people. So that's how that, 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 that peace, that, that, that celebration is celebrated now. And then of course, gifts of alms and, and those who are in need are given. So, what is the message for all message for us uh, uh, in terms of all this? Well, um, that 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 phrase that that um, Mordecai places before before Esther, you know, it's a very it's a very um, uh, important or challenging uh, um, phrase, you know that. Who knows that what the position that we're in, the, the, the life that we have, don't think of it as, oh yeah, sure, you know, we live in a comfortable life. We can just enjoy what we have. You know, what Mordecai said to Esther was, the things that you have, you have been blessed with, don't think that it's, it's just by luck. What are you going to do with that? And, and Mordecai's challenge to Esther was, you know, the gifts that you have, the blessings that you have, how are you using that to save your people? And of course, um, um, you know, for just this time as this, you know, what opportunity do we have before us? Um, I'm going to stop the, the sharing so I can see everyone.
and share you uh, with you. Um, a couple of weeks ago, there was a um, there was a uh, 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 I don't know uh, a dinner uh, for religious uh, and, and um, the interfaith community to come together. And during that time, um, uh, they invited uh, an imam, uh, which is a uh, 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 one of the leaders within our. Um, Islamic uh, faith community to, to come forward. And he shared with us something that, that I thought was pretty interesting. Um, uh, Dave and, and Linda, you might remember this from, from that dinner. He shared that part of the tradition of uh, when they pray for the food, right? It's not just giving thanks to God. Oh, thank you, God, for the food that we have. Um, you know, let us enjoy it and be healthy. Great. Yay. He explained that in the in the um, Muslim tradition, Islamic tradition, when they pray a uh, 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 prayer of thanks over the food, it's not just a, a, a prayer of gratitude. It's also a prayer of conviction that because of this food, what am I going to do to help others? So when we are blessed with something giving thanks that the attitude of gratitude is not just being thankful and saying, yay, I received something, thank you, God, and stopping there. There's always that second part. That second part is because now that you are thankful, now that you have received something and then you are thankful, what are you going to do with that? And he really shared that. And, and I think a lot of people, and again, there's, there, um, a lot of Christians, you know, different denominations, uh, different, uh, you know, very ecumenical, but also people of various faiths as well. I think we were all sort of convicted by those words, by thinking, wow, yeah, you know, when we receive something and, and, and then we say that we're thankful, what are we, are we just thankful for ourselves and then that's it? What's the next step? And that next step is what do we do with the things that we have received? for the sake of others. If we are, are truly mindful of those, you know, sometimes when we pray, you know, we are, we are mindful for those who do not have as much, you know. Um, I remember when I was um, a, 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 a kid, you know, one of the, the, the prayers that um, I was taught in my Sunday school class was to pray for those who, who um, do not have the food that we have to eat, right? Well, okay, we pray for them, but we pray for thanks for the food. We pray that... The, you know, um, to be mindful of them, but then what? It's the same thing that um, Mordecai was 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 uh, telling Esther. Just you know, just don't think that you know, just because you know you've been blessed and you were able to, and now you live comfortably, you know, just don't think that that's just all for you and that's it. What are you going to do with that? And and in that crisis moment. It was a call for him, uh, for her to respond. What, you know, from her position, what could she do? And it meant for her to risk her life in doing so. And that's, you know, that's, that's one of the key takeaways from the story of Esther. What are your thoughts? That reminds me of those who have received a second chance, such as their cancer was operated on and it went away, but they got a boom. Uh, something they hadn't expected that made a big difference in their life. Um, that many cancer patients really make a commitment to do well afterwards, to live a better life, to take care of their bodies, to uh, sometimes they start support groups or a variety of things. But that's what that reminds me of is when we have a gift, we also have an obligation. Yes. Others. I like how it is, how you said that, um, that, you know, when we are given a gift, we do have an obligation. Now, I, I, I don't want that word obligation to be feel like, oh, now oh, we are yeah. obligated to do it. But there is a calling, you know, when something of a blessing or gift that we receive, something especially that one, like you said, whether it be a second chance in, in healing or a second chance in, in life, uh, uh, you know, anything from a job to whatever that happens, 
that part of gratitude has to then um, translate to something that is beyond ourselves. How, you know, the calling that um, Abraham and Sarah was given, you know, the, 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 uh, in Genesis was that God didn't just call them to just be followers of, of God. And then, and then God promised them that, you know, he will bless them with, you know, the children and land and so forth. But the blessing was so that he can be a blessing to others. You know? And so there's our phrase that he was blessed to be a blessing to others. And I think, you know, some, a lot of times when we are blessed, are we thinking that we are blessed to be a blessing to others? I think another word besides obligation might be opportunity. Opportunity. You know, take off the blinders, look outside yourself. Right. Yeah. Any other thoughts? And it's hard to do. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to do. Yeah. Hi, Anne. Oh, Anne, you're you're muted. Do you know how to unmute? Mm -hmm. Let's see. Can you unclick that? Oh. There you go. Okay. No, um, I had one of my granddaughters was in Las Vegas several years ago when that terrible shooting uh -huh. was on. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay. And she was, you know, she was spared and we always said, and she always said, she her life was saved for a reason and she must be very mindful of how she lives right now right so yes when you say that I, i'm thinking of even uh john wesley's story you know john wesley when he was five years old or something like that he, you know he was in a fire the parsonage that he lived in um you know with his um uh, his family um samuel wesley and, and susanna wesley um and his how many uh, brothers and sisters remember that he he was one of 18 children that they had um, wow. um you know not all of them survived anyhow uh, but but in that fire everyone got out except him he was on the third floor of the parsonage and and the story goes that the the, the parents susanna wesley saw him on the third floor and they thought oh my gosh we lost another one um but he survived. Uh, he was able to jump from the window and there were um, people down um, on the ground and they caught him. And so ever since then, uh, he, was, um, he was nicknamed uh, a brand, what? Brand pluck? A brand pluck from the burning. Um, that was his uh, nickname, I guess. Basically, uh, it was the, his mother, Susanna Wesley, instilled it within him to realize that he was saved for a reason, mm. right? And that became the, the the start of the Methodist movement. Wow! And so, you know, like you said, when we are, you know, when when something amazing happens to us, like Bev said, it's an opportunity. What can we do from that? beyond just say, thank you, God. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Other thoughts? Well? I think that's something that most likely begins very early in a child's life, that the seed is planted mm -hmm. by a teacher or a parent or grandparent. It's harder to learn it when we get older, because we have lots of habits and routines and things yeah. of that nature that uh, call for our attention and to move on. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and so as you say that, it's something that it has been instilled in us from a, an early age, you know, from children to think in that ways that to, to think in ways that the stuff that we have, it's not just for us to enjoy ourselves, but how is it shared, you know, in the kindergarten, you, you, you think we, we teach this in preschool, right? How to share everything, but we don't really think about, well, when we give thanks for the, you know, like our food and things that we have to even that 
think in terms of how can we extend this beyond in serving others. You know, that's a, that's a, a way of thinking that has to be instilled when they're young. And that's why in this Jewish tradition, the, the festival of Purim, again, it, it's, it's the story of Esther is read twice every year and it tries to instill that type of thinking of now that, you know, the, the life that you have, no matter how hard it may be, there are blessings, but each time you um, give thanks, it's not just giving thanks to God, it's giving thanks, and then what? The Purim celebrations I've been to, the kids get dressed up as Esther and Mordecai and the whole crew, and uh, the story's read, and they sometimes yes. act it out. They do. Uh, but it's a very joyous it is. Uh, celebration, it's, and it's one that you can do with little people. Yep. yep. But don't our life experiences... They're important because as we age and we experience life, we find more things and more ways in which we can do more for others and influence others. Yep. And I think that happens in our nation too. As, nation, as nations grow, as governments grow, as things happen, you become more aware of ways in which you should show your thankfulness in how you act and what you do. Amen. That's right. Again, you know, we have examples throughout even our history and, and of course, definitely these biblical stories, you know, that call upon us that, you know, our faith is not one that that it's all about, you know, um, it's not one way. Like, it's all about what I, all about me, 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 what I can get out of it, and that's it. Mm -hmm. it's an, our faith is an act of service. It's, yes, we give thanks to God, and we, our, our, our faith is uh, based upon the grace of God, but then there is this um, living out that faith in ways that serve others you know as jesus said i came to serve not to be served but you know, to there there is always this sense of okay because we have been blessed how can we be a blessing to others i think that america compared to other countries in the world the word that i think about in that is the word to volunteer mm -hmm. to step past yourself and do something. There's a variety of things you can do. Uh, but I think volunteerism is something that may have grown yep. out of that. Yep. I, I also feel that history is important and we don't look past, we don't look back on history. And that's what's a shame now, as we're not teaching history or we're not realizing what is happening and what history has taught us in the past and how we move forward in uh, history is always valuable because you don't want to make the same mistake over and over and over again right that's what that's when we say history re, uh, repeats itself is when we make the same mistake over and over again and so learning history helps us to know um well this happened and those are the mistakes so let's see if we can do something different it opens <laughs> If you don't know your history, you're doomed to repeat it. Exactly. That's what the old phrase goes. Yep. Um, and I think as a country in general, up to the 12th grade, we are woefully neglectful in teaching our own history, in teaching our place in history, and really teaching them, our students, about the values that the individuals had that made history or participated in history. The, there are some people that are very unusual <laughs> with great gifts that made things happen. I have a quote on my refrigerator I just went to get. It's from Dr. Ben Carson. Smart people, wise people, use their history in order to improve. Other kinds of people try to bury their history. 
And I think it's a very true quote that happens. Hmm? Sure, yeah. And I, that brings me to the thought, Helen, that there are parts of our lives that we're not terribly pleased about. That's and true. we try to bury them, our history, instead of looking at what we can learn from what we did that was not very useful. That's right. And that's a it, hard job. It is a hard job. My list is this long. <laughs> <laughs> it is a hard job, but it's so true. And it's kind of, it, it resonates, you know, yeah. in how you react to things and how you uh, interpret things and how open. And to me, the most important thing is to be open to what we did in the past, but we also have to think we're not living in the past right. and things were different in the past. We can learn from them, but we don't. Our culture is different from what, what, what it was in the past. Sure. Yeah. Go ahead. I was gonna say, you know, I, I just got through teaching the, um, the Methodism class on Sunday mornings and Again, in our Methodist uh, quadrilateral, you know, the, the way that we are taught to think is, you know, what we always, you know, base our, our, our understanding by reading scripture, but we always have to balance that with tradition, which is understanding our history and how things were taught in history, but then also ut utilize our brains, you know, our reason to think through um, um, uh, the history and the, and the scripture, and then also our experience, um, you know, what we experience in life. So all of that has to come together. Um, and so again, tradition is a big part, um, understanding our history and our heritage. And definitely in this, um, you know, lesson from the book of Esther, you know, whether it's a true story or not, yeah. it doesn't matter. You know, whether it's fact or fiction, the fact is, you know, it's used in the Jewish tradition as a teaching tool every year to encourage, you know, one, give thanks for what we have. And that's why it's that during that time of celebration of Purim, they celebrate the, their survival over genocide or hardship. But then the, the, the lesson beyond that is, well, what are you going to do with that? Yeah. But did we do? Did we learn? Because we read Esther, we hear, you know, and it's uh, genocide. But what happened? We have genocide in with Hitler, with Holocaust. We have genocide now occurring in uh, China with the um, with the Uyghurs, and we have genocide occurring in other countries. We don't seem to learn, huh? Yeah. Or well, I think about Helen's remark that we don't need to go back and live in the past. Mm -hmm. When I think about today, that the big thing on our agenda uh, is the gun laws. And one of the arguments that is made is that we are not living in the 1700s when the colonists had to uh, bill it and had to protect themselves. That's one of the arguments is that we aren't living then and our constitution has to recognize that. Yeah. Right, but context Hitler, is very important. Hitler took away the guns, took away their way. And that's why uh, Hitler came to power. So, you know, we have to learn both ways. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, context is very important, but um, yeah, again, and as, as we kind of started this, Bev, the way you just kind of said, you know, as you're getting older, you have to learn new things and, and, and there's no real roadmap, is there, right? No. History, yes, we can no. learn certain things from history, but continuing forward, and, and it's, it's a matter of deep introspection and, and understanding of, okay, what do we do next? That there's no real roadmap to life. And that's why we have faith. Uh, mm -hmm. We have to continue that, that, that life of prayer and discernment. What, what, and and the, this, this practice of asking ourselves, of you know, learning, 
what okay, this is what we have now what do we do that's right. right i think you have a blessing at uh, your church that there are many role models to give us a little bit of a road map uh the gal that's what church is you're right yes and and the great gals in the martha group i look at joy and you know, I remember, oh, she she figured that out. I can figure that out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? So that's a great asset to have. Now, how do we get our youth to come to church and realize that there's so much to learn from our older generation? <laughs> Good question. Good. Well, it, that, I don't know. I think that's probably some of the fallings of our nation at this point right now because morality and understanding and faith have our country was founded on faith yeah. and you go to washington dc and you go to the jefferson memorial and you see all those statements all around the memorial you go to lincoln memorial you you go to martin luther king you see all these statements and yet they don't resonate. I don't know how to make them resonate with young people. Again, that's our new roadmap that we don't really have a roadmap for. Yeah, yeah something that we're going to have to continue to grapple and figure out. And so, and so we pray. Well, it's 418 now. So um, thank you for those of you joining me. I'm so sorry for those who are going to have to watch this as a recording because I forgot to send that reminder of that we had a Bible study. But next week uh, is the last of our sessions. Um, and we'll be looking at, we'll finally be moving to the New Testament. We'll be looking at the um, the, um, at the three Marys, Mary Magdalene, Mary of Bethany, and uh, uh, Mary, Mary of Nazareth. Um, so okay. we'll be looking at the three Marys next week. All right. Okay, well, thank, thank you, everyone. You. All right.